Welcome to another episode of Love and Heartbreak, Real Estate Unfiltered. We give the, the peeled back view, unfiltered version of really what goes on in the industry. No fancy lights and cameras with the exception of our you know, amazing Studio 25 here with our uh, host, Greg Litt. Um, so today I'm sitting here with Brett McDermott. Uh, Brett, thanks so much for joining. Brett is an amazing agent I have the pleasure of working with when he started in the business about 10 years ago. So he have been doing this for about 10 years. Uh, Brett, this past year in 2022, you were one of the top three fastest growing agents in our company at Elegrin out of about 180 agents or so. Uh, Brett also does the Doing Big Things podcast, and I just love watching you grow from day zero to where you are. Brett is one of the most consistent people I know with having a strategy and then implementing it. So he's had a lot of clients, a lot of experiences, a lot of fun stuff from early days with rentals and shares and things like that to you know, now doing quite a bit of sales in New York City real estate. So Brett, thanks for joining. Sure. And uh, would love to just dive right in and why don't you, you know, kind of get, it's, it's not always easy in this business being an agent. And I just commend agents so much for what they do. Um, you know, what have been some of like the, the challenges that you've kind of faced in your career? Sure. Well, you know, thanks for that really nice introduction, Mr. Willig. Pumped to be on the show today. This is pretty cool stuff. As far as, you know, challenges, I think, you know, the same challenges that any entrepreneur starting any business would face. And it's just like, if you're coming from a nine to five job where you're used to a paycheck, you know, you start a business and that's no longer the case, right? So you are really, you know, you're only eating what you kill, you know, so, so to speak. So I just remember, my first really couple years were kind of, you know, pretty pretty barren, right? I mean, I was closing the deal here, closing the deal there. I still had a, a part-time job on the side just because I had to pay the rent. Um, but I remember, boy, just watching that bank account just tick down and down and down towards, you know, almost zero. And I, I think it was like maybe like a year into my career and I was still kind of struggling to get my footing. And I remember um, I was actually like hawking this Cal Ripken rookie card um, <laughs> in Midtown. I was like going to all these different shops, like memorabilia places, trying to get a good price for this thing. I was hoping I would get like a thousand bucks and be able to pay my rent with it. And like literally, the I think the most anyone offered me for like a mint Cal Ripken rookie that day was like $150. And I was just, I was gutted. So I was like, I'm not giving it up for $150. So I actually, you know, obviously things got better from there. You know, the rent's paid. <laughs> Do you still have the Cal Ripken card? It's on my, it's on my desk. <laughs> it's on my desk and I just look at it every day. I look them right in the eyes and it's just a reminder to just like, you know, make your calls today. Do your follow-up, do your showings, get done when you have to get done so you don't have to try and sell Cal Ripken again. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's funny you mentioned that actually about Cal Ripken too and that he's that person that's on there for you because he's the steward in baseball of Mr. Consistency. What was it, like 2,800 or whatever? I, I don't know the exact number, but like number of games. So like talk about like consistency. You know, he's, uh, he's that guy. Um, <laughs> <laughs> that I, I actually never knew that. That's actually very uh, yeah. It's, very it is. It's ironic that he's the Iron Man in baseball, right? And he was the guy that I was trying, you know, to just you know keep the lights on with that day. But yeah, he's a reminder. Work yeah. hard today, man. You know, you don't want to be back at this point again. <laughs> <laughs> so, so clearly, you've made it a little bit. Yes. Uh, you got past that first year until the Cal Ripken card. You know, what's like a particular story, just like inside look from maybe some of those early days as you're trying to make it, you know, not everything goes your way, you're being consistent and you hit challenges or you gotta work real hard. What's like just a real interesting story you might have from one of those? Sure, I mean, when I first started as a rental agent, I mean, that is just the wild, wild west. I mean, you know, you are out there pounding the pavement, 20,000 steps every single day, showing like eight apartments to every group you meet, you know, sometimes showing 20, 25 apartments in a single day, just dripping sweat. I mean, you're working your butt off for, for, for those commission checks. Don't get me wrong, I had a blast, but it is <laughs> certainly a different pace than, than I'm at right now. I'm no longer showing 25 apartments a day, thank God. Um, so, you know, I would say like, and this probably happened a variety of times, but I can remember one group, and I was showing them this really cool three bedroom rental for like $5,000 a month on, I think it was First Avenue and like 12th Street, you know, primetime East Village location. That's where all the NYU students wanna be. 
And it was an open listing, which in New York City means any agent can rent this apartment. It's whoever gets the deposit down first. So I was showing it to my clients. I could tell that they were really starting to like it. Like, you know, they had the happy, you know, feelings coming out of their eyeballs. You know, when you can tell when a client really starts to uh, enjoy themselves inside of a listing. So they were loving it, but I could also see out of the corner of my eye that this other group that was seeing it at the same time with another agent, they also you know, had, had the happy laser beams coming out of their eyes. So everyone was just loving this apartment at once. Um, you know, I tried to you know, play it cool, downplay it, not try and show our hand while we were in there. We got to the end of the block, um, you know, walking down 12th Street. And right when we, when we turned that corner, I was like, Guys, they love that apartment just as much as you did. If we don't get a check into this landlord within 45 minutes, you know, we're going to lose this apartment. Um, so I think they, they felt the urgency in my voice. You know, we power walked to the nearest Chase Bank. Um, and actually, as we were in the bank, I saw that other agent and his clients walk into another bank across the street. Like literally saw them. We, we did not make eye contact, thank God. They didn't see us. So... So, so we still had the upper hand, I think. So, you know, we went straight to the... You put ski masks on so we, they didn't see you. you <laughs> that would have been a good idea. You know, I should have actually kept ski masks in my briefcase. Just four ski masks for my clients just in case this happened again. Um, so I saw this guy. I know they're going for a check for the same unit. So I'm like, guys, let's get up there. Let's get the check. We got the check. We had an amazing, you know, teller that just really got it done for us super quick. I shook their hands. I'm like, I'll let you know how it goes. And I took this check and I ran across 12th Street towards 6th Avenue like Usain Bolt, or at least that's how I felt. I'm sure I didn't look like Usain Bolt. I probably looked like, you know, an overweight 26-year-old that was balding, but it felt like Usain probably, Bolt. Probably the Cal Ripken version of Usain Bolt. Yeah, <laughs> right. Yeah, I looked like Cal Ripken stealing one of the three bases that he stole in his career. <laughs> So I'm running down 12th Street, sweating bolts. It's like, I don't know, July 15th or something, ridiculously hot day. Um, I'm wearing like my, you know, my Cole Haan shoes that are just about to wear through at the sole because I've taken so many steps this summer. Um, you know, get to the landlord's office. There's like a line for the elevator. I like find the nearest stairwell. I'm sprinting up the stairs, you know, just trying to get this $5,000 check to this landlord to secure the apartment. And like I get up there and I remember like the entire office just like turned and looked at me and they're like, whoa, like there's a homeless guy here. Like, <laughs> like, what is this guy doing? He looks like a psychopath. Um, luckily, you know, even if you look like a psychopath, a New York City landlord is still going to take a $5,000 check. In. <laughs> so we got the check in, we secured the apartment and, um, you know, that was just an average day in the life of a New York City rental agent. So it's like the, the motivation of having to, you know, pay your rent and going through all that. I mean, what I hear from that is like how much, you know, you've actually gone above and beyond for your clients at different points and in some of these processes and when you're working the deal. And I think that's like one of, I'm sure, many great examples, you know, of that. You know, how important to you is like when you are working with clients, like obviously that's a very evident way for them to feel, you know, you're going above and beyond, but, you know, maybe talk to me a little bit about that piece of uh, the business and building relationships with clients. Sure. I mean, just kind of like showing clients that I care, just the relationship part of the business, basically. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, I've I mean, always... that's a great example of going above and beyond. So I'm curious, you know, just your philosophy on that. Yeah. I mean, I guess, you know, the philosophy I'm just working with clients in general is always, you know, have their best interests in mind. I think as long as you keep that mindset on every interaction, how can I provide value to this client? How can I save them time and money on the way to achieving their goals? So long as you just stay from that mindset in everything you do, then it, at the end of the day, things are going to work out for you too. So I'd say just keep that mindset with everything that I do. So I'm sure a lot of people who are talking, they're talking about maybe bad experiences they had with real estate brokers where they're like, oh, I had this, <clears throat> you know, this bait and switch broker and this broker who told me I had to you know, put a deposit down now or I was going to, you know, lose the apartment mm -hmm. and all this type of stuff. But in that situation, in that setting, I mean, you actually saw the other people at the bank, you know, and it sounds like when you communicated with your clients, like they really trusted you that, you know, you weren't BSing them, that you were kind of like really giving them the, you know, the real thing there. How do you, you know, to me, that's, you know, let's call it, you know, making a sale, but how do you approach sales in that setting? It sounds like you had a lot of trust. Like, what are some of the strategies and tactics you use? Like, I saw you start to kind of, 
get into a little bit of that with when you noticed they were in the apartment there. So sure. Well, I think you kind of what you know you just touched on is, you know, they are not going to buy into the any of the urgency you create unless you've already built trust. So trust is always number one, and that usually takes you know a number of appointments, right? Like you know maybe you take them out once, twice, three times. You're building a relationship. You know by the time you get to that third appointment, they're like, okay, this guy Brett is the real deal. He actually wants what's best for us. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think it works like you meet someone at a coffee shop, you show them an apartment, and then you go, we got to get a deposit in right now. They're going to be like, whoa, like you're creeping us out. Like we're going to go find another one of the 40,000 agents that are out there because right. you're, you're scary. Um, so yeah, to me, it's all about just building trust, educating, advising. You know, I think maybe back in the day, real estate agents were gatekeepers. That's not really the case anymore. You know, if clients really want to go out and see apartments on their own, they, they pretty much can. Everything's pretty transparent online. They're working with you because you're an advisor, because you know the market metrics, you know the inventory, and you've got their best interests in mind. So you really have to keep their best interest in mind, build their trust, and really know your market. Right? I think if you're doing this part time, you know, like maybe you were in the beginning or things like that, and you really are not all in. It's hard to get mm -hmm. that, you know, get yeah. that momentum. I'd say know your market, and then don't be scared to look them in the eyes and be like, "Listen, like I know the inventory. We can certainly wait. We can keep this search going." But in my opinion we're not gonna find a better deal than the one you've got on the table. And I think it's important to voice that to them, not be scared to say that, because so long as you're saying it from the right place, you're actually trying to save them money, time, and get them the best apartment possible, they're gonna feel that authenticity and, and they're gonna appreciate it. Now, I know you've had some experiences where you put all that forward, you do all the work, you have clients' best interests, you know your market, and you walk into apartment, and there are a lot of things that are outside of your control that you just don't have the ability to do anything about. So what do you do in those situations? Is there you know, a certain story that comes to mind you know, for you with something like that? Oh, sure, I mean, plenty. Again, a lot of like, the funnier, crazier stories are the rental stories, right? Because like, you know, you're walking into these places that are usually occupied, they're occupied by like, you know, the NYU baseball team, just a bunch of guys that are just like slobs. NYU has a baseball team? They have a baseball oh, okay. team. I've, I, I've worked well, apologies with, to yes, NYU baseball players. I, I've, worked with, I've, I've worked with them all. They're great guys. Um, but, you know, you're walking into these occupied apartments on like Avenue B in the East Village and like there's just piles of clothes everywhere. Like it looks like these guys literally haven't done laundry since the semester started. Like they just brought enough clothes so that they could wear a new piece of clothing every day without doing laundry. It smells like a locker room. Oh, it smells gross. So yeah. I was with these girls that I've been working with for a while trying to find them a three bedroom in the East Village. They had like a, you know, it was a, it was a tight budget. I think it was like... 4,000, 4,300 a month for a three bedroom, which is really tough to find downtown. In New York City. I mean, it's doable. I mean, maybe not so much these days, but you know, seven, eight years ago, it, it was still doable. And we walked into this place and it was like a ground floor apartment and there was not even like a, like a, a trinkle of, of natural light anywhere to be seen. The, the, the blinds were down. It, it was like dungeon-esque, kind of smelled like mildew a little bit piles of clothing everywhere, but that wasn't even the worst part. Like the girls were still considering it because it was so cheap. We get to like the corner of the living room and I'm just trying to explore and like show them the better points of the apartment even though there aren't many. And literally right in front of us is like this massive tank with this huge friggin' snake that's just looking us right in the eyes. Like, I don't know what type of snake it was, but it was a big one that looked like it wanted to eat us. And then literally we noticed like there was another snake tank like to the right of us and we were in like this like snake dungeon of death and it was, they didn't take that apartment. <laughs> <laughs> so, but. Yeah. They took another apartment with you. They took another apartment because I didn't try and close them on the snake one. So I think that's the, <laughs> right. If, if you're ever with a client in an don't apartment. Don't try and oversell them on an apartment with a snake that's ready to bite them. So Right, write that it. one down. The, <laughs> you know, what, what's fascinating to me about this, though, is that so I had a similar situation with clients early on. And, like, we showed an apartment and there was a super, you know, who will remain nameless. But he was just, you know, we went down to try and find him to, like, let us into the apartment. Yeah wasted out of his mind, you know, talking to the clients and like, you know, saying all sorts of crazy, you know, crazy stuff to them. And, you know, there, there was no way to recover. It was like probably on one of those first appointments. And I, I remember like, I liked the client so much. I really wanted to help them and I wanted to help them with something else again, but it was kind of like everybody just went their separate ways after that. So mm -hmm. your ability to still work with those clients, I think like really speaks to 
like such a high level of you know trust that I think your clients must keep with you. So sure, you got to you know kind of approach it. I think this is a line that I'm stealing from Ryan Serhant. But like when you're working with buyers or you're working with renters on that side of the equation, you just got to come at it from the mindset of you're shopping with friends. You know, like you're out there, you're getting to know them, you're having a good time. Of course, you're advising them and you're giving them tidbits that they find valuable about the market, about the unit along the way. But a lot of it is just approach it like you're hanging out with your friends. I mean, that's why this job is so enjoyable. You're hanging out there with two, three hours showing apartments, just having conversations with really interesting people. Anyone looking to rent or buy in Manhattan usually has a pretty cool story. And you know, at the end of the day, they wanna feel like they're shopping with friends. They don't wanna feel like they're being sold on things aggressively. So you've had a lot of friends you know, clients that have become friends or maybe actual friends and things like that that you've, you know, worked with. What are, you know, what would be your best piece of advice for a client who's about to look for an apartment? What's your most given piece of advice? Let's actually go there. So the piece of advice you tell the client, you know, the most, and let's start with maybe that. Yeah, I mean, I would say it certainly differs from like, you know, renters to buyers. I'd say, you know, with buyers, I think always, and this is just kind of like a standard thing, is, you know, it helps to have a pre-approval, right? It helps to know your price point, what you're aiming for. It helps to have that in your back pocket. So when you find the right listing, you're ready to make an offer. Because without a pre-approval, most owners are not even going to look at your offer. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I don't try and narrow my client search down too much from the beginning as opposed to, like, you got to pick a neighborhood. You know, you, you have to know exactly what street you want to live on. I found, you know, since the pandemic that more and more people are flexible with their location. A lot of people are working from home two, three days a week still. And whereas maybe they didn't want to do that commute to Brooklyn before, now they're okay with it because it's only like two days a week. So I think less and less people are attached to a neighborhood. So I don't try and get them to like really narrow down their criteria too much in the beginning. But I'd say, yeah, first thing first, let's get that pre-approval so that we know what price point we're aiming for. Cool. Great. And what about like for those renters and like the crazy rental market and things like that? What's been your most given piece of advice if you're, you know, a renter who's going to come into the market? Yeah, rental market, I'd say much more important to, you know, know your criteria, you know, definitely know what price point you're aiming for. Have your documents ready, you know, have your tax return, your, your bank statements, your offer letter, all that stuff in, in a nice clean PDF that we can send over to the management company when we put your application in. Ha, you know, have your documents ready. If you need a guarantor, let's have his or her documents ready as well because um, it, it's competitive out there. And it's like when you find the right option, if you're not ready to pull the trigger, you know, someone else is. Nice. So. Have everything in a row if you're a renter. I think the saying in Manhattan is uh, rentals move at the speed of light, sales move at the speed of sound. So <laughs> that's, that's, about, that's about right. That's so, about right. So the faster you can have everything ready to go if you're on the rental side, puts you at a huge advantage. On the buyer side, really take that time searching and educating yourself to the inventory and the market yourself. There's nothing like that sort of hands-on approach. And hopefully you're with a good professional who can really help, help to make that an easier process for you. Uh, what about for agents who might be listening? What's like? What's a piece of advice that you need to remind yourself of constantly as you've gone through time here? You know, over the last ten years. I'd say that it's just it's a relationship business. You know, it maybe like if you go through a week, maybe you didn't put in any applications or put anything into contract. But if you spoke to five new homeowners and built five new relationships, then that's a win. You know, at the end of the day, I think the goal is just. How many people can I meet voice to voice or face to face and continuously offer value to over time so that when they are ready to transact, they do it with you. So to me, I think it's a relationship business. Build that database, stay in touch with the people you need to stay in touch with, and that those are the real minor victories that lead to huge growth over time. I, I, I love that. I think a lot of people get caught up on you know, the tail wagging the dog and they're looking for the results to happen and that's gonna make me happy. And, you know, time and time again, I hear all the top people say exactly that in terms of the relationship. So it's such a good reminder to focus on that process and really stay tuned in with uh, with that. Um, as we kind of wrap here, what <clears throat> what does success look for, look like for you in this business, and what does it look like for you moving forward? What are you focused on that for you is success in this business? Well, you know, I think. Of course, uh, you know, it would be a lie if I said that, I, you know, success doesn't have a little bit to do with revenue and profit. You know, I think any business owner has to keep their eyes on those two metrics because they're super important. And I think a lot of us do, you know, kind of measure our success on those metrics. But, you know, on the flip side of the coin, 
I think as a business owner, you know, you want to be running a business. You don't want the business to be running you. So, you know, how effective have I been at, you know, delegating things so that I have a little bit more freedom in my day? You know, what type of lifestyle is my business allowing me to live? What type of freedom has my business given me to, you know, whatever, go to Paris for two weeks if I want to. Or if I wake up on a Thursday and, and my little boy who's 11 months old looks me in the eyes and is just smiling with that big goofy smile and I just wanna stay home and just hang out with him, like I've got the freedom to do that. So like to me, like you know, being a successful business owner and entrepreneur and agent is of course about like the income, but it's also, it's more so about the freedom and just your ability to live life on your terms. I love that. Uh, a couple things you said there. There's a, a saying that I've heard, and I'm not going to take you know credit for it, but in one of my mastermind groups, we talk a lot about you know revenue is vanity, profit is sanity, and That's I think if you're one. a business owner and you're looking to grow your real estate business, a lot of people just get focused on building the top line, building the top line, building the top line, or you know it's all about the look and feel you know in this business. But if you have more profit at the end of the day, it's going to allow you that you know freedom for your life, and I think those are the vehicles that gets you to where you want to be uh, you know, for your life. And I love what you said about the business not running you. Mm -hmm. you, know, you running the business, the business not running you. So I kind of love that. That'll uh, stick with me. For nice. Sure. So any other uh, parting thoughts or anything you, uh, you're just feeling or want to leave everybody with? You know, I'd just say it's been awesome having this conversation with you, brother. I, you know, I'm really excited for this podcast that you guys are building. And um, yeah, man. Thanks for having thanks, me. Thanks, man. Well, thanks for sharing the stories. I really appreciate it. Some really good tidbits, some funny stuff. That's what we're uh, here for. Just give everybody a pierce back of the veil. And uh, we'll see you next time. Thank you for listening to this week's episode of Love and Heartbreak, Real Estate Unfiltered. If you got anything that made you laugh, learn, we'd love to hear your comments. Got suggestions? Send us an email at podcast at elegrin.com. Big thanks to our support team. And we'll be back next week with more unscripted stories. And until then, like, subscribe, please share this with friends. And in the meantime, have fun, help people, and enjoy.